Welcome to episode 85 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the work of writer director J.J. Abrams, as well as his greater Bad Robot Universe. I'm your host for this week. My name is Marcel Anastroza, joined as always by my fellow co host, Matt Crandall. And on today's edition of the show, we'll be talking about Fringe Season 1, episodes 14 through 15. So, first up, is the episode entitled Ability. It opens with a scene very much. We find out what happened with, we revisit Mr. Jones. So we see in like the previously on him escaping, him getting beamed out of prison. And I'm thinking, okay, here we go. This is going to be a mythology heavy episode. We're going to hit the gas on our continuing storyline rather than just the mystery of the week. But we also do get a fairly interesting mystery of the week because we see at a newsstand, a dude picks up a $2 bill and shortly thereafter immediately starts going like Neo in the Matrix demanding his phone call and his mouth and his orifices start melting and and growing over with skin in a disgusting effect. So I love that right off the bat, we're saying this episode is going to have both. We're going to have the mystery of whatever the hell is happening with this guy and the $2 bill. And we're going to have the ongoing little Hill ZFT David Robert Jones stuff happening. So what are you thinking? What are you more interested as this episode starts off Marcelo in the, mystery of the week or in the Mr. Jones stuff. I am so happy that you made that opening reference to the matrix because in the opening of this episode, when the old man's face basically scabs over shut, I was like, that's, they stole that from the matrix. And usually you point this out when you're running the show, but I'll get rid of it now. Did you notice when the old man knows, notices that his orifices are closing up, the camera does like a first person shot of the old man trying to walk down the street while the old man is trying to walk down the street a couple of steps. He comes across a guy with a bald head and a hat. So it was like the most obvious sighting of the observer ever. It was great that he was in it and noticeable so that if you have been kind of forgetting about him, because some of the last few episodes, it's been really like a blink and you miss it appearance. And this one reminds even like the casual viewers this guy's still out there. We have, we're not done with this guy. As intriguing as the sort of the A story of the week was, I gravitated towards more of the mythology aspects of this episode with Mr. Jones. I really liked the scene where he comes out of the, uh, the oxygen tank and he asks for a cup of tea. He's talking to one of his goons and his goons... Is just basically telling him the, the the lowdown of where his finances are and where everything is. And ever so slightly, before they cut to the next scene, he takes a sip of tea. And very so slightly, his hand starts twitching. So I'm like, wow. It's very interesting how they showed the time travel effect. In that when you time travel, your molecules, since... since this machine is crude and since this machine hasn't been per- hasn't been perfected by starfleet academy it it you know it regenerates you but it regenerates you in the wrong way and because of that your cells start to break down in your own body and i just loved the explanation to that and the overall image of that seeing mr jones suffer yeah, that was great. And I do love that right off the bat, they remind us what this is in case we haven't remembered or in case you are just watching Fringe for the first time. And they say, Walter, tell Olivia what those things that Loeb stole actually do. And he says, well, when I made this device, it was a transportation system. And I call it Disray because it's basically disintegration, reintegration. And Peter says, tell her all of it. And he's like, well, it also works across time rather than just across places. 
And they're like, so are you telling me that this guy Star Trek himself? And they do mention Trek. And um, he says, yeah, but if someone were to use it, like the side effects would be catastrophic because I haven't actually refined it or been able to figure out certain things. So then we do see that as Joan steps out of that tank and it, you know, Walter mentions like someone would have to spend a few weeks in that tank to even acclimate afterwards. And so we do see that he has been in this tank for X amount of time. But as you mentioned, when he raises that teacup and we see that tremor, we know, all right, this guy is on, he's free, but he might be on borrowed time here. So he himself might have a ticking clock because we can see that even though they follow these protocols, he's starting to have adverse effects. And Walter has let us know that these might not be survivor, survivable effects. So this might be, you know, Jones has only got X amount of days before this <laughs> ruins his body because they're using unknown science. So I like that aspect. And then we realize that the $2 bill thing is a, like a micro powder organism thing that causes your cells to grow over any holes and they have to stop that and they are getting ready to try and mobilize to find where they can f track down Jones and then he shows up in the lobby and turns himself in you know Joker style like he wanted to get caught and so we know that he's not going to give us all the information we need but we know that there is also something important there so I like that Rather than being a manhunt, they take that off the table and they just make it this one-on-one -on -one between Olivia and, and Jones by the end. But of course, right at the beginning of this, when Jones comes in, Harris is still all up in our grill being a complete piece of crap. And so he won't let, you know, Olivia go in there and he wants to do it. And you're just, I'm pulling my hair out every time this guy shows up. And not like in a fun, like, I love to hate this guy, just in a, I hate this guy way. <laughs> so every time he is interfering, I'm like, does this guy not know that he sucks and that our team is good? So like, please step out of the way. Let us do our thing because you don't know what you're doing. And we already know that Olivia gets information out of people because earlier in the episode, she did meet with Mitchell Loeb to try and intimidate him and find out more and in that interview, she basically does realize that ZFT, which they thought was an organization, might actually be the name of a document like a Bible that this group actually believes in. Marcella, what are you thinking when we're getting this information that ZFT might be more than just the name of a group and... There are shades of like there is a war coming and there is something else on the horizon here. Well, I will say first, very quickly, to go off of one of your points, that fucking idiot guy who is doing the audit of the fringe division is the most annoying little shit I've ever seen. I'm like, why are you here? Just fuck off. Because we don't need you, because you're a big giant roadblock. He's a big giant roadblock. As a matter of fact, a thing that he does in this episode, because he doesn't allow Olivia to see Jones right away, that ultimately that ultimately leads to the death of one of their agents. I don't know. He's just got this air of asshole about him. Secondly, uh, to, to, to move on to your second point, it's interesting because seeing this series for the seventh time, I think, for me, it's really hard to sort of see it with a fresh head because I do know all the pieces. I, I, I do know I do know where all the pieces on the board eventually do fit, but I do forget things here and there. But I will tell you, the first time I saw the series way back when it aired in 09, I had no idea what ZFT was or who wrote the book that they go after in this episode. But in hindsight, I keep thinking to myself, if these people, if ZFT wanted to help Olivia unlock a certain ability, which is mentioned, is sort of, the, which is sort of hinted at in this episode, 
why didn't they just come straight out with her? Why, why didn't they just come straight out with it? Why do they have to kidnap her? Why did they have to strap her to a chair? Why did they have to do a spinal tap to to see that she had a, a cortexophan in her system? But then again, if you kidnap Olivia, she probably wouldn't have given them the time of day to explain. So I don't know how I would have gone about trying to sit her down and say, listen, there's something about to happen here that you're not going to explain, but you need to sit down and listen to me. How do you think you would have handled that? Yeah, it's tough to say because, <laughs> again, I feel like there's lots of times where Olivia doesn't have all the information, but even if people were to give it to her, would she believe them? So I feel like it's it's tough to say like, oh, if they had just come right out and told her what it was all about, if it would flow the same as her discovering this information over a long game and then believing it because she has had to dig to find it. So I think that's that's part of it. Now, this episode, this episode is super dense with like mythology. So we are jumping all over the place. But that's because in this 50 minutes, there is like so much to unpack. They discover that ZFT is not the name of a group, but is the name of a book. And they it's some German phrase that translates to destruction by advancement of technology. And they try and find it by going to that bookstore. And before that, we realize that there, there's like all these weird connections that Peter is trying to use to get the book, but the book is very hard to find. And they don't know if they can actually find the exact book because it's been in evidence, it's been lost, all this stuff. Um, so then when they finally do get their hands on the book by the end of this episode, we find out that in it, it details how technology and the world can be used for traveling between universes. And that this is a multiversal situation. And there may be two similar universes and there will be a war between them because only one of the universes will be able to survive at a certain point. And so this starts our minds spinning like, wow, okay, this is broader than just some sort of time travel teleportation. If we're talking about a multiversal situation, which when this episode aired in 2009 would have been a lot for general audiences to wrap their head around as people are listening to this in 2022, everything is a fucking multiverse, everything. Then it's like all anybody wants right now is give me the multiverse of madness. Give me everything everywhere all at once. I just want it all. So I like that fringe got there first. And this episode tells us that that's the, the main thesis of ZFT is that one day there will be a battle between universes and only one can survive. So we find out that Loeb and Jones are working together because they're trying to prepare our universe for this inevitable war. And in part of preparing, they need people with special abilities. And it is revealed that the reason they kidnapped Olivia is because when she was a kid, she was part of a special drug research trial for a drug called Cortexafan. And they believe that this gives her abilities that will make her a key player in the battle between universes. And all of this is coming at us as we're still trying to solve this mystery of the week. And like every scene is like another like, what the fuck? Holy slow down. They go to massive dynamic. They talk to Nina Sharp. Cortexafan, Cortexafan. I'm like, what is happening? So it's so much to unpack. And then, of course, uh, Mr. Jones sends Olivia out to to stop the thing that's going to be the mystery of the week tie up and also give us more information. And she has to disable this light box without touching any of the lights. And that will prove that she has is one of these Cortexafan kids because that's a special ability that she will have. And she thinks that it's rigged, but actually we're, we're still trying to believe if she did it or not. 
And so there's so much information coming. What are you thinking, Marcelo, as we're learning about multiverse, Cortexafan, the trials? You mentioned that when this episode aired, you know, the general public, even I, who am a giant nerd, I've been that way my entire life. The first time I saw a multiverse on TV was Fringe. So I was just blown away by what they were able to do way back in 2009. And I really think that it was something special. And the storytelling in Fringe, at least in the first three seasons, right, is really, really meticulous. And it's really smart. And the great thing, and the great thing that the writers do is that they drop hats on the ground. And those hats are pieces of story that they pick up weeks later or years later. And I love, I love the style of storytelling that they decided to undergo uh, with Fringe. But as I'm watching this episode back in the day, I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? Like, does he really think that Olivia will be able to stop this bomb? just by turning off these lights because earlier in the episode, she thought that she had fooled Jones by having Peter rig the original box that she found, but she had no idea that where she was going to go was going to lead her to another bomb that the only way to turn off this bomb is to do the light thing. So I was like, you know, I think Olivia's going to die. So I was very, very concerned the first time I saw this episode because I thought she was going to die. Because I didn't think for a second she was going to be able to turn off those lights. When I watched this episode today, I was really impressed with the acting of Anna Tor in this episode. Especially when she's standing there looking at the light box. And the look on her face. Because, because all throughout the episode, she doubts herself. Like, this is impossible. I can't do this. There's nothing special about me. I wasn't a part of the original trials. I grew up in Jacksonville on a military base. And when she's standing there in front of the, the, the light bomb, just the little twitches on her face, like you, like you can tell when she starts to believe in herself. And when she starts to believe in herself, the lights start turning off. And then all of a sudden, they all turn off. But later in the episode, Mr. Jones is, you know, presumably gets wheeled away to another prison. And he asks Astrid before he leaves, before he leaves Walter's lab, he asked her, did, you know, did she do it? Did she turn off all the lights? And he goes, that's my girl. So that makes me think that Mr. Jones knows Olivia from earlier in his life. But the thing is, Olivia has never met Mr. Jones. And also the thing that I'm wondering here is, does, does Walter know more than he's saying? Like, look. As I said before, I know all the secrets. I know what's going on here. But the end of this episode, when when I saw it for the first time, it blew my head open because I'm like, holy shit, Walter is the author of this book, of this manifesto. What does that mean? What's going on here? Is he lying or or, or is he too screwed up to really understand what's going on here. It was amazing the first time I watched this episode. And it was genius today. But the first time, it just oh, took my breath away. Yeah, it's an awesome ending, especially because we know that Walter has his memory holes where he doesn't remember certain things. So as we see the manuscript, once they get their hands on it, we notice that every time... There is a lowercase y. It is slightly adju- it's slightly up. And at the very end of the episode, the minute that Walter pulls out his typewriter, we know where it's headed. We know what this scene is going to be. But it almost looks like Walter doesn't know this is where the scene is headed. Because as he types the word ability, the title of the episode, we notice that the y is raised. So we know in that moment... Walter fucking wrote this manifesto and it's like, holy shit. Does he even know that he wrote it at this point or has he forgotten? So I like that we have those questions. We do get the information from sharp that there was a cortexafan clinical trial 
in Jacksonville, Florida in 1981 or whatever it is. And we have the information that Olivia spent time there as a child. So that's like a bombshell. There is that moment where she fakes out Jones, but then they realize that Jones knew it was a fake out and he sent them here anyway. And so then we're wondering, did they think they were too smart and are they going to get outsmarted here? And is this going to be catastrophic for team fringe? And she does turn off the lights and it's all fine. And then when they go back to, to visit Jones, he has escaped and it does say you passed on the wall. So they are establishing this guy as like some sort of, he's kind of like the fringe Hannibal Lecter where like him and Olivia have this back and forth. She's Clarice. He's always one step ahead. And I like that, that dynamic, especially knowing that Kurtzman would go on to do a show about Clarice. It, it makes sense that there's a bit of that element to this in this multi-universal thing. This aired in February 09. Trek 09 comes out in May. And that's where, like, we've got a multi-timeline story where, you know, Spock Prime comes into it. So this was kind of prepping the world for where they were going to be taking us in in their big summer movie that would come out after this. Um, so there's, like, shades of, you know, you guys know what a multiverse is, right? Like, you kind of get that there can be two timelines that exist and there can be two Vulcans, one is destroyed and one is whatever. Like, so I, I dig that there are shades of the exterior lives of the people making this show are kind of seeping into this a little bit. Massive dynamic. And I'm going to bring it back around. Just give me a second. Massive dynamic has been very, very cagey this entire series so far. And Nina Sharp when when Olivia first come, when when Olivia first goes to Master Dynamic to ask Nina Sharp for help, she says, "There's something wrong. With, there's something wrong with my hand," and I'm like, "Why would she say that? Why would the writers write something so innocuous and something so specific?" Also, when she looks at her records, she says, "Oh, I can't find anything." Right. You know, you know, the testing areas were in this spot and they weren't they weren't in any other places. And I'm thinking to myself, she's lying because she is the executive of the company. So she would have all the records at the tips of her fingers. And the other thing that I'm thinking about is she has to know about a certain individual that we're going to meet in a couple of weeks here, finally, because we've been talking about him. He's been teased up the yin yang at this point. She has to know what is going on here. So do you think that the fact that she doesn't tell Olivia everything is to not overwhelm her or, or, or because wouldn't it be better if Olivia knew everything or do you think that would be too much for her to process? And by extension, the audience I think it's a bit of both. It would be overwhelming and tough to deal with. But also, this is strictly on information that I know that we don't have right now. I think that part of it is she's trying to protect Olivia. So she knows that if she gave her all of the information, it might actually be too much and she might run dangerously into a situation and put herself in more danger than she needs to be in. And as we have learned long game wise, Nina Sharp cares a lot more about Olivia than it seems right now. I feel like a lot of this is kind of someone thinking that they are parenting in a way and and keeping, you know, you don't tell your kids everything unless they absolutely need to know stuff because sometimes the real world is too scary or whatever. So I feel like it's kind of like a moment like that where I'm hiding stuff from you, but it's for your own good. But that still remains to be seen because we don't have all the, the the clear picture isn't there yet. And as you mentioned, William Bell still looms large over all of this massive dynamic Cortexafan talk. And it was interesting that Nina Sharp's artificial arm gets a tweak <laughs> and uh, is is back up to snuff. And it's like, hmm, yeah, what's what's going on with this stuff? So there are a lot of breadcrumbs that we're starting to get a sense of stuff and there is definitely a lot more to dive into and also of note the cipher in this episode spells out Olivia. So this is clearly a very Olivia heavy mythology episode compared to 
almost anything we've had before. This really is putting the spotlight on Dunham. Is she special? How did she become special? What the fuck happened to her as a kid? We move on to the final episode that we're going to talk about this week, entitled Inner Child. We just talked about ability, which was nothing but mythology. Tons and tons of mythology. So much happened. Which brings us to Inner Child, where, like, nothing fucking happens. In a good way, though, because I needed a break. So this is one where... It's mostly almost all mystery of the week, except for like a very key moment near the end where at the beginning we see this building that's going to be demolished. And this guy gets a magical sort of sense that maybe the building isn't as clear as they thought. He runs back in and they discover down this long tunnel, there is a kid living who's like a feral child who he looks like Bat Boy from the National Enquirer or something. He's just all white. He's got red around the eyes. Um, And they realize that he maybe is something more going on with this kid, which is why we call the fringe people in, rather than just like we found some homeless kid living in a tunnel. And we have to piece together what his deal is At the same time, the other thing Fringe sometimes likes to do is reopen old cases. And so we find out that Charlie Francis has been tracking down a serial killer named The Artist. And in the opening of this episode, he gets a fax that shows him that The Artist is basically at it again and going to strike again. And over the course of this episode, as... Team Fringe tries to deal with this child and figure out what his deal is, and they realize key things like he needs less oxygen to breathe, and you know our environment is going to kill him if we don't acclimate him. He doesn't really speak, but he's got some sort of empathy and maybe some sort of weird connection, and we realize that he might be able to help us catch the killer, which is like a, a sci-fi movie thriller kind of concept that they've distilled down to this 45 minutes and it is fun and interesting. And I think it's a nice breather after ability gave us so much that this one was like, you guys can just put your feet up. Don't have to worry about getting the notebook out and writing down every little breadcrumb. This one's just a straightforward mystery of the week thriller. And at the end, we're going to throw you a, an observer bone. In, in a big way that no one could miss. Uh, what are you thinking, Marcelo, as this one kind of pumps the brakes after last week? I really like the relationship display between Olivia and this child in the in the episode because before Olivia gets called to investigate the mystery of this child, she sits down with her sister and her sister says... You know, we've inconvenienced you enough and we just found an apartment and we're going to be out of your hair in a little while. And Olivia doesn't really react. She reacts, but she's like, eh, you guys could stick around for a while. You don't necessarily have to leave, but if you want to leave, it's fine. And then she gets called to the case. But through her interactions with the child, I mean, when she, um, because the child really imprints on Olivia Dunham, he somehow feels what she feels and and you know feels what she wants and and stuff like this and i love the scene where she tries to get the kid to eat for the first time and she starts playing with the m&ms and she takes out all the yellow ones because when it comes to m&ms i don't like the yellow ones either so i found that to be really really intriguing i'm like oh my god i have something in, in common with olivia dunham this is so cool um but as much as I liked the A, the, the A story stuff with Olivia and the kid, I really liked the B story with the artist. But I thought that that, that section of this episode was really, really um, underwhelming. And it wasn't really written particularly well. There wasn't enough there to make me say, this is the best B story that Fringe has ever done. I think if this episode had been given a little bit more time to cook, 
would have been so much creepier and so much better because this guy kills women and then chops them up in his van like Dexter Morgan and then fills them with with embalming fluid basically and strings them up and leaves them all across this all, all across the city of Boston for the FBI to find so that within itself was fascinating to me but they really didn't develop that episode they really didn't develop that story thread as much as I wanted them to the artist serial killer was a real creep and we do see him lure his first victim at the laundromat and son of a bitch <laughs> is in a wheelchair and he's trying to use that as sympathy. And bastard. then he stands up and injects her. And I was like, this bastard, like what a piece of crap. Um, and then, so that is interesting that we, this is like a real world, you know, heavy murder plot going on. And then we use the fringe side to trap this guy. So what he was mostly doing to them is not on the fringe science stuff of things. It is not he has superpowers or he's supercharging these women. It was just a straightforward, this guy's a sick fuck and he's killing people. And the kid that they find, because he is a super empath, as we sort of find out, him and Olivia have that unique connection where they can kind of communicate non-verbally and then he also gives us the clue because of the candy he makes a yellow arrow design and then later the fringe team sees that on a van the air freshener and they realize this was the kid telling them that this is the the guy the artist and so they are able to save the day and capture him before he kills again so i liked that the kid part was interesting because it's not we've left the massive dynamic cortexafan part of it behind for now. This is like just this kid who's been living in like a weird spot that this could happen even if fringe stuff wasn't kind of going on. But it's his connection to Olivia and the way he's able to sense the artist that raises more questions for us. And then after they solve the horrible brutal murders we're gonna put this kid into foster care or whatever and as he's driving to go to his new place we see the observer and they both lock eyes and in those moments we're looking at the observer and then we're looking at this kid and you're like these guys look like two of a kind here there's something and the way that the observer locks eyes with him all right, maybe this feral kid is not just some random feral kid. Maybe there is more at play here that we haven't fully understood. And if we got this kid a trench coat and a fedora, maybe we would start to see a, a bigger thing at play here. So I liked that as much as it was grounded in reality with the killing aspect, we did bring it back with that observer moment to say, this is somehow tied to the larger story. So don't worry, we gave you a break, but we've still got everything. The pot is still boiling. The simmer is still happening. We're getting back to it shortly. The other thing that I find very interesting is that there's a social worker guy that shows up various times throughout the episode trying to trying to get the kid away from Olivia and the FBI. And this social worker guy... After one of his after one of his visits to the hospital, he's walking down the hallway and he gets a phone call, and he just says, "Oh, I think we may have found another one," and it's never really explained who that guy works for, and I'm thinking, who would that guy possibly work for? Who's the who's who's like a really nefarious organization that we know in the fringe universe that would do tricky dicky stuff like this? And I'm thinking, I bet my bottom dollar that that guy works for Massive Dynamic, but I have no idea why Massive Dynamic would want this kid until the very last scene of this episode. When you watched this episode for the first time back in the day, did you were, were you sort of confused about the importance of that phone call from that social worker, or did, was that something that went completely over your head the first time you saw it? I probably noticed it a bit and it's partly just because as we have established on fringe, 
anybody who shows up in a suit and claims they are someone from something ends up being there for for bad reasons and working as part of the pattern or with massive dynamic. So the minute that this social worker shows up and then takes a suspicious phone call, I'm thinking uh, my massive dynamic radar is going off for sure. Uh, just because literally everybody that has showed up as an interagency lend or whatever has turned out to be some sort of turncoat in our limited episodes so far. So when this guy's there and then takes a weird call, I'm like, yeah, this guy's a, a, a mole or working with the bad guys or, you know, somehow in cahoots with someone. So I definitely am not taking it at face value, and but did notice it enough to be like, hmm, something's going on here. When Walter figures out that the kid has some sort of ESP connection and the kid can help them find the artist... Walter wants to hook up this kid to the same device that he used to amplify that guy who picked up radio signals, if you guys remember mm -hmm. him from earlier on. And that device was actually drilled into that guy's head. Uh, Peter goes, are you kidding me? You are not going to use the rig from the ghost network and drill it into this kid's head. He's a kid. You're out of your mind. But I love how Walter puts the kid's mind at ease. He plays a record and he, and, and the record that he plays is love and happiness, which is a great song. And he starts dancing around and he shows the kid that this thing of a Bob is not going to hurt him. And, you know, the kid ends up putting the thing of a Bob on his head and then Walter turns on the thing. And then he, he articulates that the kid is connected by radio waves or something like that. What did you think about that whole sequence about Walter wanting to drill holes in the kid's head and then Walter putting the kid's mind at ease by dancing around to love and happiness? So my, I, I love the dancing around and the music was, was fantastic. My two favorite moments dialogue wise and Peter Bishop, Walter dynamic wise of the episode are that moment where <laughs> you're talking about and Walter says, like, we want to use this thing. And Olivia says, last time you used it, you drilled it into a guy's skull. And Walter says, well, if you don't think he likes it, I guess it could be modified. And Peter goes, really? He didn't mention that to the last guy. Like, if it was possible to modify this, why did we screw it into the other guy's skull? And so I love that. And then the other uh, Walter Peter thing is um, they're meeting with Olivia and Walter's wearing a bathrobe. And uh, it's one of those put the mouse back in the house, buddy moments. And um, Peter's like, uh, dude, like you're you're hanging out here. And Walter's like, don't be such a prude. I'm sure Agent Dunham knows what a penis looks like. Don't you, Agent Dunham? And then Peter's like, my father, ladies and gentlemen, like, how, how am I putting up with this shit? So I just those moments uh, were really funny, fun moments of levity in a very serious otherwise episode. So I did love those Walterisms and bringing back a device that we are familiar with and showing us a way that they can use it to solve a different crime and tap into something else rather than that ghost network was really cool because I do love every time they bring back something they've already established. It lets us know that this is a real world where you know, in the lab, they've got all these tools. You don't have to only use one once. It's like if if a hammer works, grab a hammer again. So I liked that we were able to apply this. And I just love that moment. Like you didn't think to mention that to the other guy. <laughs> like I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have loved. And yeah, the, the love and happiness is a great moment. And that Al Green song, you know, amazing song. So it's just a small fun, you know, moment there. How much longer do you think, uh, Olivia's family is going to be around? Cause all due respect, I do like the little girl who plays Olivia's niece. But I'm like, what is the purpose of this? We talked about it. A, we, we, we talked about it a couple of weeks back, but I just want to get your final thoughts on that situation before we wrap up for this week. But how long do you think they're going to stick around for? Because I'm like, dude, why are they here? The cynic in me, like the, the behind the scenes TV guy, when they had showed up, I told you it was because there was probably a network note or something like we need to see more of Dunham at home and we need to get whatever they gave it to us. Now this is like six weeks later, 
people have had a chance to see the episodes and the overwhelming response is we don't like them get them out of here so then they're like oh we're gonna get our own apartment and we're gonna just fuck off for a while so i was like oh the network note was can you give her a home life and then the next network note was not like that so i just part of the cynical part of me is like they realized the part that they want is they do want to maybe play with that love triangle with Rachel, Peter and Olivia a little bit, but maybe they don't want to have to have Dunham be like a surrogate mother. Every time she goes home, maybe we don't have to follow her home as much because as they head into these final batch of episodes, you know, this is a 20 episode season. This is episode 15. They realize we don't have a lot of time to spend with Olivia's sister and niece because our overall story is much more important that we've been building. So I think that they were just like, let's have them move out to sort of take them off the board until we need them again. So they're still in Boston. They're still in the area if we want to bring them back. But as we head into the end game of the first season, they were like, we put too many chess pieces on the board. We can't actually play chess with this many pieces. Let's take a few off so that we can make the moves we want to make. And you mentioned we're getting kind of late in the first season of Fringe. And I think next week and in the coming weeks, the the story that we've all been hinted at here is really going to start to blow, blow the back of our heads open. So I don't think that, I, I, you know, I, I think I'm right with you. I don't think they have enough time to show Olivia's home life, even if they wanted to. Yeah, I think it's for the best. And that, that was just the one moment that I was like, Hmm, yeah, we're going to just sweep them aside a little bit. We got to have some good stuff coming up. If we want to put them off to the side next week, we are going to look at episode 16 unleashed and episode 17 bad dreams. So if you guys are watching along, those are the ones to watch for next week. Uh, that'll do it for this episode of Radio 815. Listen, if you guys like anything we do here and want to reach out to us, there are a couple ways to do that. First, you can just reach out to us by using the hashtag on Twitter, Radio 815, or you can reach out to us on our personal Twitter account. It's JJUniverse815. If you want to talk to me personally, you can also find me on Twitter. I'm at CreekFanatic88. But Matt, if the good folks at home want to chat to you about anything at all, what would be the best place for them to do that on? On Twitter, at Matt Crandall. All right, guys. So with that out of the way and done with, until next time, as always, we'll talk back soon. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.